The Apostle John said, Then I looked, and I saw around the throne and the living creatures, myriads of angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, Be blessing and honour and glory and might for ever and ever. In our first hymn, we are privileged to join in that song as we sing 480, Crown Him with Many Crowns, the Lamb upon His Throne.
Now let's pray together. Since we have a great high priest who has gone into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us come with confidence to the throne of grace. For we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with our infirmities and weaknesses, but we have one who was tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet without sin. And so, Lord God, we come today with a sense of expectancy. We come to hear from you, to praise you, and to know once again your grace and your mercy. And we need to come because you are great and we are small. You are wise and we are foolish. You are holy and we are sinful. You are eternal and we are mortal. And so we thank you for all the gifts with which you surround our lives, for loved ones, for families, for friends, for all the blessings of that this world gives us, and for the means of grace and the hope of glory. And above all, we praise you for our Lord Jesus Christ. We have never seen him, but we believe in him. We praise you for all that he has been in the past. We thank you more for what he is now. But most of all, we thank you for all that in his mercy he is yet to be. And so we pray that you will forgive us our sins. You will pardon us from all unrighteousness. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worldly magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, let me welcome everyone, whether you're in this part of the building or somewhere else. We are delighted to see you. And if you're a visitor, um, please please um, make yourself known to someone. We trust you will feel at home and be greatly blessed. Now, the notice sheet, there isn't too much to mention. It's fairly self-explanatory. Except notice that on Friday the 26th, there is no Activate and Tron Youth because it's the bank holiday weekend. The bank appears to have endless holidays, but this, this is one of them coming up next weekend. And obviously, we rejoice with James Woodier and Neam Richardson, who are to be married in St Andrews next Saturday. We'll, we'll pray for their blessing, for a, for a wonderful day, and for a happy married life. I love romantic stories. <laughs> that clearly is the beginning of one. Now, we're going to come to our Bible reading, which you'll find on page 859. We're reading in Luke chapter 4. The Gospel of Luke spends a great deal of time on the early days of Jesus' ministry, perhaps longer than the others. And this is one of the great and important episodes. Luke chapter 4, reading from verses 1 to 13. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, 
lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. You know, we're going to sing John Henry Newman's great hymn, Praise to the Holiest in the Height and in the Depth. We praise the hymn on the screen. Now we'll have a break for a moment as the musicians play and we take up the offering.
So let's pray. The Apostle Paul said, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. Lord, we have nothing to give you, nothing to offer you, nothing that can impress you. And yet, in your grace, you allow us who have nothing to give to you who has everything. And we pray that the gifts laid before you will indeed be used to build up your kingdom here and in other places. And we pray, Lord, that your work will advance that until the earth is filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And as the election draws near, Father, we pray particularly for our own nation. We pray that, um, we pray that um, those elected may indeed rule in the fear of God. We pray, Lord, that you will call people into Parliament and into other, into other places of government, people who fear you, people who love you, people who know you. And indeed, we think of all the areas where public opinion is influenced, the media, educational world, and all, these, all those people who are listened to by others. And we pray that your voice may be heard again in our land. We know, Lord, that in our nation we have followed ways that are not your ways. We have followed the devices and desires of our own hearts. And we thank you, Lord, that if, if we sin, as we do sin every day, that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And we pray, Lord, for all of us here today, Many of us begin the many of us begin the week. Um, all of us begin the week with um, different expectations, different hopes and fears. Very particularly for James and Niam as they are married on Saturday, and we pray that you will bless them on the day, and that as they join together, heirs of the grace of life, that you will lead them and guide them through all the days of their life. We pray for those who are anxious, those facing exams, those maybe about to change job, those who are looking for a job, those maybe about to leave home. And we pray, Lord, that whatever the circumstances that you will bless, that you will guide. In a moment of silence, let's bring to the Lord someone or something which is on our hearts. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to his power of work among us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus now and in eternity. Amen. Now we're going to sing again number 389. It's a fine hymn by Timothy Dudley Smith which reflects on the passage we've just read. And we'll, and we'll be studying. 389, Christ our Redeemer, new temptations are in desert places silent and apart, and three times over met the tempter's power with God's word written, hidden in the heart.
Now, could I ask you please to turn once again to page 859, the passage we read, chapter 4 of Luke, verses 1 to 13. And we'll have a moment of prayer. Our Father, we know that as disappointed, frightened, and disillusioned disciples walked the road to Emmaus, that the Lord Jesus Christ joined them and showed them in the scriptures the things about himself. And we pray we may have that experience today when Christ caused their hearts to burn, their eyes to be opened, and sent them out into the world with the message that the Lord is risen. We ask that this may be our experience today in his name. Amen. Every single one of us, whatever age we may be, from the time we are old enough to decide what is right and what is wrong, to the very last moments of our life, are faced with temptation. We're all faced with the same kind of temptation. We're not all faced at different points in our life with temptation of the same, the same nature. But it is a daily battle with what elsewhere is described as the world, the flesh, and the devil. I googled temptation and discovered there were 13,600,000 entries. I didn't read all of them. <laughs> Indeed, I didn't read any of them. I noticed one, though, that said, five steps to take to avoid temptation. I thought, aha, that will be a help. And then I thought, well, of course it would. It's rather like those things in the, the, you read in the Reader's Digest in the doctor's waiting room, five ways to impress your boss, ten ways to improve your marriage. Now, I've read these idly and forgotten them the moment that the doctor or dentist called. And I have never in my life met anyone whose life has been changed by that sort of thing. Because that, if it does change, it simply changes external behaviour. It doesn't change the deep attitudes, the deep patterns in our lives. So you see, we mustn't begin this passage saying, how am I going to avoid temptation? That is entirely the wrong place to start. Rather like looking at the story of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17 and saying what this story is about is that we have giants in our lives. The big bully down the road, the awkward boss, the difficult colleague, and we have to fight them. But that's not what the story is about. The story is about the fact that the Lord's anointed defeated the giant and therefore we can defeat the giant as well. And so it is here. The Lord Jesus Christ met and defeated the devil, and only in him can we stand against temptation. That's where we need to begin, with this face-to-face -face encounter with the devil. Now John, sorry, Luke, I'm going to get the guy's name right. Luke, um, from the very beginning of his gospel, has been authenticating who Jesus is. The very beginning, Gabriel comes to Mary and says, the child to be born of you is the Holy One of God. Simeon, Simeon greets him in the temple as the one who is to come. And of course, the angels over the plains of Bethlehem. And John the Baptist had authenticated him. And even more so, the voice from heaven, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And then at the end of chapter 3, this, the, the long family tree of Jesus, tracing him back to Adam. This is Adam come again, the last Adam, the, se the second Adam who to the fight and to the rescue came, the descendant of the woman who is to crush the head of the serpent. So that's where we begin. Jesus met and defeated the devil in the power of the Spirit. So Jesus, full of the Spirit, led by the Spirit, because as a man in dependence on his Father, Jesus was led by the Spirit, and we need the power of the Spirit to face the tempter, because we cannot resist him on our own. The old hymn says, the arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. 
I'm sure many of us here have relied on the arm of flesh and it's let us down again and again and it always will. So what is temptation about? What happens when the devil comes? First of all, in verses 3 and 4, the devil said, if you are the son of God, command this stone to be made bread. Don't trust God to provide. That's, that's the first thing. Don't trust God to provide for our needs. Now, of course, we know that Jesus could have to change stones into bread. As Timothy Dudley Smith says in the hymn we've just sung, he makes not bread what God has made a stone, he at whose bidding water turns to wine. Read, read the instant in John chapter 2. Jesus turned water into wine, not to, prove he, not to prove something, but to show his glory. His disciples saw his glory and believed in him. And behind this story lies another story, the complaints of the people of God in the desert in the book of Numbers, complaining, 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 doubting that God could provide. And the psalmist in Psalm 78 commenting on this said, they said, can God provide food in the desert? Now this is the point. Can God provide food in the desert? There are a couple of things here. First of all, it is not an appeal for fasting. Fasting is an important biblical doctrine. That's not the point here, because daily bread is one of the requests in the Lord's Prayer, give us today our daily bread. We see, once again, it goes back to that story. We've been looking at Deuteronomy recently, words from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Moses said, God is taking you into the land. He's been faithful to you in the desert, so you can trust him in the land. It is written. That means God has said it, and God can be trusted. Now, it doesn't mean that it's not just about food. It's excessive concentration on outward needs and distrusting God. There's nothing wrong in having a healthy appetite. But gluttony is, gluttony is bad. Indeed, Paul vividly speaks of this in Philippians 3, verse 10. Their God is their belly. Now, our God may not be our belly, but what would we write if we were writing that phrase and putting in it our particular temptation? So you see, you see that it is trusting in God. My God, says Paul, will supply all your needs. This is trying to short-circuit that. And secondly, it underlines God's care. As the son of Adam, Jesus will live depending on God's care. And of course, there's another story behind this, isn't there? A story in Genesis 3 where the serpent again, same serpent, same devil, came to Eve and said to Eve, did God really say? And instead of Eve thanking God and saying, look at all those splendid trees. Look at the fruit. Look at the luxury. God's given us all these. No, what did she say? There's one tree we're not allowed to eat. One tree we're not even allowed to touch, which is a lie, of course, because um, God has said nothing about touching. See what she's done. She's turned his grace into a bullying negative. Isn't that what temptation does? Lord, you've given us all this, but you haven't given me what I really want. That's the problem. We, we all understand that, and we all fight that daily, don't we? You see, Eve makes, it, Eve makes his grace too narrow by false limits of her own. And so often we do. God can be trusted, but the devil wants us to live without faith. The devil wants us to depend on everything that's outwards. The devil wants us to depend on God's gifts rather than on God. And of course, when we start depending on God's gifts, we'll forget their gifts and we'll think they're entitlements, we'll think we deserve them, and so on. It is written, if it's there, if God has said it, God will not go back on his word. God cannot lie, we are told elsewhere. So, the first thing about temptation is don't trust God to provide. 
Now the second temptation, verse, verses 5 to 8, the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority in their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whom I will. The devil, we are told, is the father of lies, and like all accomplished liars, he mixes truth and lies together. After all, that is the art of the propagandist in every generation, isn't it? Don't tell blatant lies. Make sure there is truth mixed up, mixed up with it. And part of what he says is true. After all, Jesus calls him the prince of this world in John. In Ephesians, Paul describes him as the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who works in the children of disobedience. And in the book of Revelation, the dragon, the devil, summons up two great powers, one from the sea, persecuting power of the state, and the other from the land, the, the, the beast of propaganda and lies and spin, if you like. And what were we told? The devil gave them their power and their throne and their great authority. So there is truth in what he says. That is why we still pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, there's two things here. Temptation to false worship. See, until earth is fully redeemed by God, Satan will exercise great influence. Now, we know, of course, from the succeeding chapters that Jesus is going to expel demons, he's going to curb the sea, and he is going to show that Satan's claims are exaggerated. You see, if Satan's claims were absolutely true, he'd be entitled to say, worship me. You see, when he says, worship me, he's not asking Jesus to sing a chorus. He's asking Jesus for full allegiance of heart and mind. That's the, that's the problem. That's what worship is about. Worship, is, worship by its very nature has to be exclusive. I used to think I was very clever arguing with Jehovah's Witnesses. We had a great many of them in Durham. They used to come to the door. I used to argue with them. Probably I won the arguments most of the time. I never won any hearts. Convince someone against their will, they're of the same opinion still, as the old jingle says. Eventually I realized there was only one question to ask them and people of similar view. Do you worship Jesus? Not do you admire him, not do you think he's wonderful, but do you worship him? Because worship is exclusive. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you serve. So, the temptation to false worship. Who do we worship? And then the use of Scripture. Once again, quoting from Deuteronomy. Interesting, actually, the phrase in Deuteronomy, which this quotes, comes from chapter 6. Teach your children these things. That's the truth of the law, the gospel, and, and, and so on. Interesting word, teach. It's not the normal word, teach or train. It literally means sharpen their teeth. In other words, from the moment of birth, surround them with gospel influences. Obviously, it's got to be adapted to the age. You don't sit down with a one-year-old and say, now today we are going to study the prophet Nahum. Obviously not. We adapt. But what it does mean is we surround them with gospel influences, teach them to know and love Jesus, teach them the truths, and indeed make Scripture part of our conversation. Often Christians will talk about anything and everything other than Scripture. I don't mean by that I'm quoting screeds of the Bible to show how well we know it. What I mean is the gospel actually influencing our thinking and our conversation, and therefore and therefore, trust in God. So you see, the devil is ultimately saying, God is not going to bring in the kingdom. The kingdom belongs to me. And Jesus is saying, it doesn't. The kingdom belongs to the one who alone is to be worshipped, the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. 
Then the third temptation, beginning at verse 9, he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. In a sense, this temptation sums up, the, sums up all of them. Now, the pinnacle of the temple was, pro, there was probably a drop of some 400 feet to the Kidron Valley. That's a huge space, and if you're at all giddy or, or felt dizzy, it was not the place to be. This is a very subtle temptation, saying, you say you trust in the Bible. Here's a chance to prove it. Their temptation, don't have confidence in God's word. And we know, as Shakespeare said, the devil can cite scripture for his purpose, almost certainly drawing from this passage. If you are the son of God, was going to be said later, come down from the cross. I was told when I was young, a text today keeps the devil away. You fight him by throwing text at him and he'll run. Well, I did and he didn't because that is not the way to fight the devil, by individual texts. But if we try to fight him by individual texts, on the one hand, we will become extremists and tear texts out of the context, which so often happens. Or else, like liberal theology, we'll use parts of the Bible to discredit other parts usually parts about love, to discredit parts about judgment. No, it's not individual texts. Although individual texts are wonderful, and sometimes at moments of great stress, an individual text can actually mean a great deal. As I prepared this, one of my very favorite texts kept recurring to me, whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. Now, of course, people say trust your heart, and to some extent that can be true, say in a relationship, in a decision you have to make. But my goodness me, the heart, says Jeremiah, is deceitful and desperately wicked. God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. But it's the point, is getting to know Scripture, letting the Word of God dwell in us richly, as Paul says, um, thinking with the mind of Christ. And we'll never think with the mind of Christ if we neglect Scripture. Without the Bible, the remembered Christ soon becomes the imagined Christ, projection of our fantasies. So, what's happening here? First of all, it's an artificially created situation. There was no need at all for Jesus to throw himself from the pinnacle of the temple. It was simply sensationalism. Like uh, in the 19th century, there's a, a, a Frenchman called London who used to wheel, push a wheelbarrow across a tightrope stretched across the Niagara Falls. Apparently he died in his bed at a good old age, but that's, that's not a recommendation for wheeling barrows across tightrope. And he used to say to people, do you believe I can carry you across it? Oh, of course. That's right, come into the barrow. No one ever did, apparently. You see, that is just sensationalism. But here, and there, it would be very different if God puts you in some tight situation. Comes back to the bread again in the desert. After all, the, the manna stopped, Joshua tells us, when they entered the land. You don't expect manna from heaven if you live next door to the supermarket and have money to pay for food. It's wanting God always to act in, the sens in sensational ways. God chooses to do that for his own purposes. He can and will, and we mustn't limit him. But to expect that as an alternative to trusting his promises is quite wrong. You see, the devil is saying to Jesus, I don't think you actually believe in these promises. Prove to me if you do. But you see, God is not on probation. God, God has already spoken, and if he spoke... I mean, after all, think about it, even in ordinary human life. If a trusted friend makes a promise to you, you don't keep on trying experiments to find if it's true. Now, sometimes trusted friends can let us down. Sometimes because they made a promise that they couldn't, weren't able to keep. But God will never let us down. God is not on probation. And when he quotes here from 
Psalm 91, the context is about attacks on the faithful and God's promised protection of them. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. Interesting in Matthew's account of the temptation, when this temptation is over, the angels come and minister to Jesus. So, you see, he's, what Jesus is essentially saying to the devil is you don't know your Bible at all. The devil is doing, so he's taking texts. That's why there's no use throwing texts at him, because he knows the texts. The point is we face him in the power of the risen Christ, the living word, to whom the written word points so fully and faithfully. Well, you see, this story, while it's about temptation, is, is actually about Jesus. Who he is, what he is, what he has done, the promised Messiah, the Son of God, the King of Israel, the, the vo- uh, authenticated by the voice from heaven, and the culmination of the story that began with Adam, the wisest love that flesh and blood, which did in Adam fail, should strive afresh against the foe, should strive and should prevail. You see, we need to know our Bibles. Not know our Bibles, as I say, in the sense of showing off our knowledge, but knowing them uh, as, as the food we need, as the strength we need, and we need to, we need to get to know them better and better. And that's why, that's why we're committed here to expository Bible teaching, which ultimately is the only way in which the whole of the Bible is going to be, is going to be given. So, the, verse 13. When the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. These times are going to come thick and fast. Demons, the raging sea, Gethsemane, the cross itself. And of course, at the grave on resurrection morning, angels in bright raiment rolled the stone away, kept the folded grave clothes where his body lay. And for us, uh, it's going to come every time as well. There is never going to be a time on earth when we're going to be free from temptation. Alexander McLaren, a preacher of a much earlier generation who was noted even in days of Victorian grandiloquence for his powerful metaphors, said once in a sermon, the hounds of hell will pursue you to the verge of heaven and leave their fang marks in the golden gates. We need to realize that. So as we finish, I want to say two things. First of all, don't treat the devil right lightly. Peter says... Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. devour. Now, remember the devil is is a subtle enemy. Oh, there are people who involve themselves in black magic and all the rest of it. But that's not the most common way the devil works. The most common way the devil works is by lies. When you hear, did God really say you know whose voice is being echoed there. Don't treat him lightly. Don't imagine that we we'll, can stand against him in our own strength. That's the first thing. The second thing is, don't be afraid of him. He is an enemy, but he is a defeated enemy. After all, if Peter tells us to resist the devil, that means we can do it. And Resist the devil, says James, and he will flee from you. You don't need to do what Martin Luther did and throw an inkwell at him, but at least that showed how powerfully Luther was aware of the devil. The most important thing about the devil is that Jesus Christ has defeated him. Never forget that. That's why Paul is able to say at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the strong one who defeated the devil, who who destroyed his power, and who one day will banish him completely. And we pray, Lord, that we may never try to face temptation on our own 
that we never try to think we are too clever or too holy. Help us to trust in the one who has gone above and who is at God's right hand interceding for us when Satan tempts us to despair. And so bless us now and go with us in Jesus' name. Amen. In our final hymn, we end as we began with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You are the word of God the Father from before the world began. Apostle Peter said, be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, crawls along like a roaring lion. Resist him, firm in your faith. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. May that same Lord Jesus Christ walk with us through our lives, guard us, in all temptations, and bring us in the light of grace to the light of glory. Amen.